Hey, everybody. Aaron Dillon here, Managing Director of AG Dillon & Co. Uh, we're a venture capital firm focused on pre-IPO companies and working with uh, individual investors, financial advisors, and institutional investors. Uh, check out agdillon.com uh, for access to our information about our venture capital funds. And uh, all right, so got a great one for you today. And we're talking about a full year 2022 pre-IPO company update for you. Uh, we'll hit on the following. We've got the top 10 companies by valuation for the beginning and the end of 2022 with some comparisons. Year-to-date returns for notable pre-IPO pre companies, at least what we got up to this point for the year. Uh, we got focus on companies, pre-IPO companies with positive returns for the year. There weren't many, but I'll highlight the ones that did come through. And uh, top 10 fundraisers, top 10 exits, and, uh, and then we'll also open it up for some Q&A. Now, the one thing that is different about today's uh, 2022 analysis, I open it up for kind of global stocks. Most of the reporting and research that we do uh, on a weekly basis is for developed markets only. So that's U.S., Europe, uh, parts, certain parts of Asia like Japan and Hong Kong, et cetera. Uh, this we've opened up to full global. So we got India in here. We got China in here. We have parts of Indonesia in here. Um, uh, not a lot of Russia, obviously, uh, this year, but... Uh, but certainly some of those other countries sneak, sneak through uh, and Brazil as well. So, all right, let's jump into it. All right, here we go. So first up, we're looking at uh, the top 10 companies by valuation in December of 2021 versus 2022. So this is the beginning of the year, the end of the year. Um, uh, we've, got, uh, we've got some interesting companies here. We have these ranked uh, one to 10 by the starting valuation. So this is the beginning of 2022 and how these folks have done. Uh, as you kind of run down the list here, you can see uh, it, we're pretty, we got to a lot of US companies. There's obviously ByteDance, which is TikTok, right? That's TikTok uh, is a Chinese company. Uh, but for the most part, uh, but for the most part, we're kind of US dominated. Uh, do have a couple of China's, have an India in here with Flipkart. Uh, Canva is kind of a darling there uh, out of Australia. but uh, but also, it's interesting too. It's it's a lot of um, it's a it's a very kind of broad, uh, I'll call it industry or or market segment for these businesses. Um, we don't see any kind of I don't think we see anything particularly focused on one particular area that's uh, that's heavily weighted. But uh, but a few items to call out. Uh, ByteDance, while it does show that there's a hundred hundred eighty billion dollar valuation for both at the beginning of the year and the end of the year. Right, and I should say too that the reason it's not rated in December 2022 is I only look back for for firms that have raised capital in the last two years for these rankings, and ByteDance did not raise capital uh, as of December 31st, 2022. They haven't raised capital for the last two, uh, two years, so they kind of get the not rated uh, thing. But naturally, if they would have raised, they would have been number one for this year, uh, for the end of the year. But they, they're way down in secondary market trading for 2022. So. At 180 billion, these are primary financing round numbers, uh, valuation numbers that we're looking at here. But if you kind of layer in the secondary market pricing, this number, that number comes way down. Uh, SpaceX, the secondary market price is way up, and it's definitely in line with their primary financing round. I wouldn't be surprised to see if they're up considerably from the 127 billion, which is what they posted in June of this summer. So this company, SpaceX, just keeps going up. It's, it's an incredible business. Uh, Klarna appears to um, have just gotten worse, right? They just like the wrong place, the wrong time. The company's way down in secondary market trading, but they did just, they, they, they basically just had a, a wrong place, wrong time with when they needed to raise capital. The management had made a, a really aggressive decision to expand internationally. They're a European company um, originally, but they expanded in the U.S. and a couple other markets and just a lot of capital outflow. And then, of course, we hit this kind of hiccup here. Uh, in the global economy uh, after COVID uh, in 2022, and they just cut cut in a bad place. So I think they needed to go to market. They had cash flow issues. They had to go to market, and it was super depressed. Also, they're a buy now, pay later company, and I think a lot of folks were worried that their perhaps their credit quality for their their, their credit portfolio was uh, was poor. They'd have a lot of losses. I don't think that's necessarily played out, but I, I think that definitely impacted. Uh, the valuation. But uh, the recent news from Klarna's CEO is that they expect to be profitable again in the second half of 2023. So they're they're definitely making changes. Klarna is not a new company too. That business has been around uh, for 10 plus years. So uh, so the leadership team there is, I think, pretty good. I think they'll, they'll probably turn it around 
um, uh, Klarna nonetheless uh, way down 85% from current primary financing round perspective. Uh, Shine is the is the um, is the big surprise I think here, right? And it went from basically nowhere on the map. It was a 15 billion dollar company, which is not small, right? Uh, but they shot up to 100 billion dollars fast. Shine's a, a Chinese company. They do fast fashion. Uh, there's a lot of grumblings out there. Uh, I live in New York, so I talk to some folks that are in the fashion space, and there's a lot of grumblings out there. They basically identify emerging trends, and they'll create a low-cost version of that trend and get it to market super fast so they can capitalize on it. Um, there's even been some, there's even been, I've even read a few articles where they're doing this. They identify, they basically put things up there, computer generated, put it up there for sale, and they haven't even made it yet. But if they get enough demand for something, they'll start to make it and then send it out. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, so it's it's a tech first kind of fashion uh, development business, but uh, but huge growth. And they've started to make nice inroads here in the U.S. market as, as well. So 567 percent valuation increase, and they jump from 27th to number two spot, right? Um, and then lastly, you know, Chime Chime's in here 25 billion for both the beginning and end of the year. It's the same thing, you know, this, this, uh, the, in the secondary market trading, it's down as well. So it's really interesting. These companies are so big, right? I mean, if you think about it, the smallest company uh, or the largest company in the, in the Russell 2000 for U.S. stocks is $10 billion. That's kind of the cutoff between the Russell 2000 and the Russell 1000. So large cap, mid cap and small cap stocks. And, uh, you know, if, if you weren't, if these companies were public, at least the U.S. companies, they'd be in the S&P 500 most likely, and they'd be S&P 500 growth companies. Uh, but what's interesting, so what does that all mean? I think they're prof- a lot of these businesses are profitable or they have enough cash in their balance sheet where they can still fund their growth and they don't need to go to the capital markets to raise assets or capital. They can also tap into the debt markets as well because they're so big. There's ample, uh, kind of an ample capital market out there for debt financing for a, a business that's so big and doing so much revenue and generating, in, in most cases, a, a positive net income. So they're not going to market, which is, you know, in a, in a case where you're looking at primary financing rounds, it doesn't give you an opportunity to kind of reprice these, um, you know, these companies. So, but again, secondary market traders, I think a good indication, most of these guys are down for the year. All right. So looking at full year, kind of 2022, or yeah, at least year to date, 2022, late December, uh, uh, secondary market uh, pricing or performance. Uh, the companies are just, it's like a bloodbath, right? Everything's down and, uh, and uh, it's just not pretty. So I got as many of the, no- what I would consider to be notable names. These are most of the larger companies uh, by valuation and a few extra other ones. You can see SpaceX is kind of the one darling that's sitting out there. Um, you know, this said, I do think it's a great entry point for these pre-IPO stocks. I mean, they're, they're down low. The whole point is to buy low and sell high, right? Um, but a lot of these companies, most of them, in fact, have double digit growth, year over year growth, and they're taking market share for incumbents, right? And as I mentioned before, they haven't raised capital because they're profitable or they're able to tap into the debt markets, right? And they just have really solid businesses. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting time. I mean, clearly public tech has gotten beat up uh, in 2022 as well. That's translated into the kind of the private tech, emerging tech space. But, uh, but I think it's a really interesting point, entry point here. You know, anytime you buy pre-IPO stocks, you're in it for, for you probably could be in it for three to five years. So what, is it safe to say that some of these companies won't come back from these points uh, in three and five years and be, uh, you know, I, I'm not, in my opinion, materially higher? Uh, I think that's probably is the case, right? But, uh, but um, a little bit more on that later. All right. So this, these are the companies that were that were positive for the year. There were only six. Eight views. My uh, partner, data partner for uh, secondary market pre-IPO uh, stocks. Just check them out at eightview.com. But uh, but they tracked 138 pre-IPO companies. Only six were positive for the year. Had positive returns for the year. Um, some of these names you may not be familiar with. Obviously, SpaceX. We just talked about. Ramp is a uh, is a fintech company that offers banking solutions for businesses. Uh, they're they're growing really quickly, but you can see they're the they're kind of like the dotted line here that's up. So they were way up. Their stock price is way up. Or, I'm sorry, this is kind of the growth of thousand dollar chart, right? So you can see uh, all of these apples to apples and companies together. But they were way up at the beginning of the year, massive. 
and then just slowly kind of came down and into the year of 38%. So while 38% is an incredible uh, return for the year, especially when the S&P is down so much like it is this year in 2022, um, you know, certainly it's a lot less. Uh, the journey was, uh, was much different I think, for these guys than like a SpaceX, where it's basically a slow climb uh, up 31% uh, for the year. All right. All right, let's talk about uh, the top 10 primary finance, financing rounds. So uh, looking across the board, you would think in such a disaster of a year in the public stock market that, uh, you know, the primary fun funding would still not be there. It's still there. There's a lot of companies that pulled in a lot of capital this year. I mean, these are the top 10 and the smallest one pulled in $1.2 billion, right, uh, in, in one raise. And the valuations are attractive too, right? And then, so, I mean, all of these companies had increases in valuation. Um, even the ones that didn't publicly disclose, like a GoPuff, their, their secondary market pricing is up 50% in 2022. Um, and, you know, Lazada at 3.1 billion, they're going to be way up. They didn't rate, the last time they raised was 2017. So they're going to be way up. And then same thing for Securinex, which is at the bottom there, $40 million valuation. They pulled on 1.2 billion. So what does that tell you? That they're definitely well north of $40 million. So uh, still getting huge valuation increases kind of uh, round to round. And, um, and, uh, and the numbers are big. The numbers are big. And I think you're seeing it across kind of global markets. And again, it's the same, it's the same story. It's across, uh, you know, different, uh, different industries as well. So interesting year, you would think in such a poor, year of performance that perhaps the funding market might uh, freeze up a bit. Uh, I don't think it's certainly not as, uh, as robust as it was in 2021, uh, but definitely deals were still getting done out there in 2022. And there's a lot of reports on a kind of a macro deal perspective. It was down for the year in total, but I wanted to highlight a, you know, the biggest companies uh, that pulled in money uh, here so that you guys can check those out if you like as well. All right, last up, we got um, IPOs or IPOs and acquisitions for the year, the top 10 exits by company. So it was, uh, it was a good year for IPOs, just not in the United States. China was the big winner, right? Uh, Chinese investors, definitely private pre-IPO investors made out big this year uh, with, you know, like, what is this? Eight of the 10 top 10 companies were Chinese companies. And, uh, and what was interesting about this, too, is it wasn't, you know, in the U.S., we have like a lot of SaaS software as a service companies, the fintech companies, and China was a very health, uh, health sort. We have to help, too, but health companies come through big. Uh, and then it was a like real, it was like real products, so like electric cars, semiconductors. I mean, it's a little bit different than I think uh, than, than some of the stuff that we see in the U.S. The one highlight for the U.S. was Figma. That was a very publicized acquisition adobe bought figma for 20 billion dollars a huge valuation a lot of press great deal for for the figma investors i don't know we'll see how it how it plays out for adobe but i think they were feeling pressure um from canva as well which is in a similar uh, business as figma and uh, and trying to move their kind of you know desktop type applications uh to uh, to the cloud and really going to move down market i mean adobe i use adobe for uh, video editing um, and uh, image uh, image manipulation and graphic design, but uh, but uh, I mean Figma and Canva make it very very simple for really anybody to do uh, graphic design work or video editing, and then post that to social media, uh, etc. So um, that was a place that Adobe was having a hard time making inroads, and I and I think that was a frankly a much bigger market than some of the professional uh, technology services that uh, that Adobe was providing. So it'd be interesting to see how that plays out uh, plays out for them uh, in the future. Okay. All right. So let's see if we have any uh, Q and A here. Okay, we got a few questions coming through. Uh, and here I got we got the you know the pre IPO uh, research at agdillon.com/research. So check that out if you want to see more information about uh, about what we have. But uh, okay, let, let's uh, let's pull together a few questions here. All right, here we go. Here's one. Uh, do you think IPO activity will start again in 2023? Um, I do. I, I think it's it's going to turn. I think the pre IPO activity in the U.S. specifically will turn when the public market starts to turn. So I think once we start to see positive uh, positive folks, where I talked to the CIO and economists out there, naturally they think that's when the Fed pauses. 
I wish I could tell you when that's going to happen, uh, but uh, but don't have the crystal ball. Um, my hope is that that happens some point this year, that inflation comes down. And then I think once we get a few of those, uh, a few less uncertainties, right, uh, have been taken off the table, I think people will start to firm up and understand, you know, kind of what terminal value rates look like, discount rates look like, and then that will translate into the folks hitting the IPO market uh, and coming back in and, and having some nice exit for investors that were in those companies. So, uh, so yeah, I think I think the IPO market will open up in 2021 or 2023, excuse me. Um, but uh, but it's really contingent on what's going to happen uh, with the Fed. All right, here's another one. It's uh, is now a good time to buy pre-IPO stock. So I I personally believe that yes, it is a good time to buy pre-IPO stocks. And again, like you know, it kind of begs the question is like how much of an allocation should pre-IPO stocks be in your portfolio, right? Or venture capital in general being your portfolio. You know, if you're a very wealthy uh, individual or family or institution, um, you know, called uh, 10 million plus, 20, 15 million plus of investable net worth, I would say probably it, it might make sense to be 15 to 25% in venture capital. Um, you know, if you're, if you're 10 million or below an investable net worth, then perhaps it's something more like you know, 1% to 3%, but I think that's the right allocation. I do think it's an interesting time to buy. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's a three to five year hold period for these pre-IPO stocks. And it's also important to note, it takes about three to five months to buy pre-IPO stocks. This isn't like trading Apple stock from your brokerage account. You know, it's a, it's a process to go out and buy. You have to negotiate price. That's a manual, uh, that's a manual process. Even finding offers is a manual process. So we got a special way of doing that at our firm, but finding, you know, finding uh, someone who's willing to sell, negotiating the price, you have to sign a physical purchase agreement. So the lawyers get involved to make sure that we get that agreement done. Then you have to do counterparty due diligence. Oftentimes you get on a plane. I do at least and you fly and meet your counterparty, make sure that they're, uh, you know, it's appropriate. You're taking kind of a appropriate amount of risk to make sure that the deal, uh, the trade gets done and then everything gets settled properly. Right. So this is a this is a process, especially when you're trying to buy, you know, perhaps two or three or in my case, I buy 15 pre IPO stocks in the fund. Uh, this takes time. Right. So three to five months to, to take a position. So, uh, you know, do you think that uh, to the point earlier, do you think Powell and, and, and the folks that said uh, and inflation will come down in six months time in three months time in nine months time, like whatever it is, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of getting close. Uh, to pull on the trigger. If you pull the trigger now, you'd be taking a position in and around maybe when these uh, changes would happen. I mean, worst case scenario, it doesn't happen to 2024 and you got in six months earlier, but these stocks are so depressed now. I don't know how much further it would go down. And if it did, I think the, the potential on the upside is much, much better than the potential on the downside. So I do think it is a good time to buy pre-IPO stocks right now. Um, okay, let's see what other, let's see what other questions. Let's do one more. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, what pre-IPO stocks do you find most attractive? All right, so I I am a passive investor uh, by trade, uh, and I do certainly believe in a portfolio approach here to these pre-IPO stocks. I think a broad, diversified approach is best. Uh, I think best execution is super important. I work with like six to seven institutional traders when I do a trade. And I go out about every couple of months and I do an assessment across the 15 names that I track really closely and what their offer spread is. And on average, that's about 25% on average. So some stocks have even a 50%, 60% offer spread. So I call one trader and they give me a price. I call another trader, they give me another price. The difference between those two prices is 60%. So it's really important to get best execution it can make a huge difference in your returns. Right. And I definitely think the power law, you know, this idea or concept of a power law where like one or two positions can really drive a lot of the return in your portfolio is true. I wish I could tell you which of those companies it would be. But if you go back and look historically, at least for the companies that are still uh, private today, SpaceX is a huge driver. Stripe is a huge driver of kind of total portfolio returns. But I do think it's important to have a diversified approach. Um, I'm not so much worried about geographic uh, diversification or even sector diversification, but I certainly think it's important to have 
uh, a certain number of names in your portfolio, right? So I work with like a lot of family offices and they want, they call up and they say, Hey, I want to buy one company in life sciences. I really like this company. What are your thoughts on that one company? And, you know, I'll give them my thoughts on the business, but I, I, I actually respond back and say like, look, I would propose that you have uh, an allocation like four or five different life sciences companies. This is startup investing right? Um, you know, these folks do have governance, right? But I think it's wise to have a diversified approach into the space. So if you like life sciences and the technology that's happening in that space, take a position in four or five companies. Uh, and there's kind of thoughtful ways to do that, and especially if the rules-based approach, can you look at some historical returns and what that might look like? And I tell people of that too. But, uh, but that, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know if I would call out and say, which stocks do I find most attractive individual stocks? Um, you know, I would say that Stripe and SpaceX have been major drivers of kind of pre-IPO, quote unquote, portfolio returns over the last 10 years. Uh, you know, don't know if that'd be the case going forward or what other companies from this point for the next 10 years will be the major drivers of those returns. But uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's I think it's smart to have a diversified approach. So, OK, let's stop there. Uh, look, I hope everyone had a ho happy holiday and uh, and I hope everyone uh, has an incredible incredible new year. And of course, if you need anything, please, uh, please reach out to me uh, with an email or a text. All my information is on, on the website on the kind of contact us page on agdillon.com. Thanks so much.